Thank you, Susan, for your kind introduction. And I have uh, supposedly your attention for a little while. And I hope uh, that the story doesn't bore you. Uh, by the way, you know the definition of a bore? You ask him how he is, and he tells you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, there is humor in every sad story, and there are sad thoughts in every humorous story. As uh, Susan mentioned to you before, we, uh, I was born in Leipzig, Germany, and we lived a rather peaceful middle-class existence. Uh, my dad was at one time an officer in the Austrian army in World War I, and uh, still have pictures of him in his uniform. And then came 1933 when Hitler came to the throne. I didn't understand much in those days what uh, Nazism was all about as a four-year-old. Well, but as a six-year-old, I went to German public schools and uh, the persecution of Jews had already started full force. Even the teachers were viciously anti-Semitic. The teacher in class would never address me. My name was Manfred, it was a really German name. Today I dropped the man, now it's right. And uh, the teacher would only address me as Jew boy. Read this, or Jew boy, give me that answer. He would never call me by my first name. During the recess uh, in class, I never dared to go out in the courtyard to play with the other students, with the other kids, because they would beat me up. So I would stay in the back seat of the class and, and buy my time. On the way home from school, kids would follow me on the sidewalk and usually pick a fight. Every once in a while, I landed a punch in somebody's face, but usually I got beaten up and came home bloody. My parents quite realized uh, that we have to leave Germany. We, we simply can't stay in this country. No matter my father was a decorated hero, nevertheless, we had to leave. Well, my father applied, we applied for a visa to come to the United States. And in those days, it turns out that the United States was in a severe depression so was the rest of Europe, and uh, we did not get a visa into the United States. Instead, my mother, my brother, and I fled to Romania. We managed to get out there, which was still under an old Austrian Hungarian king, King Charles, and it was peaceful, and we got out of Nazi Germany. But the Gestapo was after my dad, and he fled over to France, because it was the nearest border to get across. And we thought we could get together then by train, but then the war broke out and we didn't see each other for eight years. Well, here we are, we fled from Germany to Romania. My grandfather had a nice ranch, horses, cattle, dogs, chickens, you name it. And uh, we lived quite a peaceful, simple existence. Compared to Germany, Romania was a hundred years behind the times. Dirt roads, no electricity, no telephone. In Germany was already quite advanced. In Romania was not. But it was nice. We had a river in town, and I had my own little pony that we used to ride down and jump in the river. And one day, my grandfather asked me we lived in his house, "Would you take your pony right into town and get me a pack of cigarettes and a newspaper?" Well, uh, I went into town, got the pack of cigarettes, got the newspaper, and the town drama was announcing the latest news on the city square. I was at the time, I was 11 years old. I wanted to listen to what he had to say, and I walked over to the uh, center square of the little town, and he said, the entire Jewish population of this village, and the, the, the little town, the name of the town was Seret. There were about uh, 4,000 inhabitants, of which 2,500 were Jewish, 
and the rest of the Romanians and German colonists and so on. All Jews in this town have to assemble tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock at Town Square with no more than 20 pounds on their back. And you will march, you will be recolonized. We'll, uh, you have to live somewhere else, you cannot continue to live here. The reason for it was that the town where my grandfather had the ranch was about two or three miles from the Russian border. And the war with Russia was imminent. We knew it's going to break out any day. Here in the United States, you weren't quite aware of that at the time, but we sure were. Because the entire Romanian army, the Romanians had joined the Nazi uh, Axis uh, group, and they were together going to fight and occupy Russia. Well, I ran home and uh, told my family what I heard in town, and sure enough, the news spread very quickly. And we had no choice but to pack our packs and be ready the next, the next morning on the town square. And we were told, those of you who do not obey this command and do not assemble tomorrow morning and be marched out of town, will be summarily executed. Well, we had no choice. We packed our things and met the next morning in the town square and we marched out of town. The, uh, my grandfather's ranch was on a steep hill, and at the end, the top of the hill was a little uh, church, and uh, all the Romanian farmers that used to come into town on the market day used to kneel down at that church and cross themselves and then march on to town to do their business. Right uh, behind the church were big cornfields. I have a brother that lives in Germany now who uh, wrote some books about that era. And uh, he wrote that, uh, described in one of his books, the exit of thousands and thousands of Jews marched out with Romanian soldiers with their ref ready rifles guarding us. And we all passed that little church on the way out of town. And uh, behind that church was a cornfield. And there were some scarecrows in the cornfield. And my brother's book writes a little story where Jesus on the cross looked out at the Jews being marched out of town. And he couldn't understand what was happening. And so he talked to the scarecrow and saying, Scarecrow, what's happening here? Why are these people being moved out of town? What's happening to them? And the scarecrow laughed and said, Jesus, you don't understand the realities of our life. You gave us a good message but apparently not too many people listen to it. So sure enough, we were marched out of town and uh, some old people that were bedridden couldn't possibly march out of town. They stayed behind on the assumption that sure, the police is gonna come by, they're not gonna, they're not gonna execute the old bedridden people. After all, they're human beings. And somebody had to stay with them to, to feed them or whatever. Well, the next day, however, the police came by various homes in our, in our town where some old bedridden people had stayed behind. They dumped them all on a horse and buggy, marched them down, rather, with the wagon down to the Jewish cemetery, and they were summarily all shot into a grave followed by all the young people that had stayed with their parent, they also got shot into the grave. We didn't know about that until after the war because we never saw the town again until the Germans and the Axis lost their power. We uh, went to uh, the railroad station and we got put about uh, as about as many people as are in this room here into a little cattle car. 
There was no room to sit down. We just pressed together like in a New York subway at rush hour. There were no toilets. There was no water. There was no food. The doors were locked. There was hardly enough air. After hours of standing in that thing, the stench became unbearable. And we for 12 days in the summer heat, that was June 1941, we were in that car. And uh, some, of, some of the older people didn't make it out alive. They, they died right there in that car. But there are lots of little stories we can tell you about that trip, but I bypass that. We were in a camp in southern Romania for several months, and then we were told the Romanians and the Germans had now occupied part of the Ukraine, and we could go back home. So we got in another cattle car train, and this time it wasn't so bad. In four days, we made it home. But we, they wouldn't let us back into our town, because our, town had, our houses had been plundered, and our old people had been executed by the local police. They didn't want us back in town. So we had to stay in a neighboring town for several weeks. And when we got the announcement that we will be deported again, this time into newly occupied Ukraine. And this was November. At this point, I really realized this is not a camping trip. This is going to be associated with a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. And I raised my eyes to the sky and said, please, Lord, not again. Didn't help. We got again packed, 80 to 100 people in a little cattle car, and we got shipped up north to the Ukraine. This time it didn't take 12 days to get that, only took four days. 200 my trip, you know. Um, we got there, and the bridges over the river were all bombed out. Uh, so the train couldn't get across. We were, all, we were all taken off the train and put out into a big number of acres of land. And train after train came to that same location. And there must have been some 100,000 deported Jews all camped out in the field. It was raining. The mud was knee deep. It was cold. We were hungry, we were thirsty. After about three or four days out in the field, after a number of people had, matter of fact, committed suicide because they didn't want to go on with that, we were marched away from that field into a little town. The town's name was called Ataki. Strange name. And there we found an old school building that was kind of bombed out, but it had a roof over it. And uh, at least we, we found a place to stay inside. And we were told to wait there until they have ferries to get us across the Nesta River. Those of us who are good in geography, the Nesta River uh, originates in the Carpathian Mountains uh, in Poland and runs down the northern edge of Romania into the Black Sea. And that was the actual border between Romania and Ukraine, Russia. There, we, I don't know how, I was only 11 years old at the time, and I don't know how we got food, or how we fed ourselves, but somehow we managed to get something. Of course, there were no toilet facilities. Everybody used the schoolyard to do what they had to do. And uh, after about four or five days in that building, we were marched down to the river to be ferried across into the Ukraine. On the way down to the river, some Romanian soldier grabbed me by the neck and pulled me out of the room, and also three or four other kids, and we had to go back to that building that we had been staying in for a number of days, and we were told to clean the courtyard, the schoolyard. We had no tools, no shovels. We did the best we could to clean that yard, or else they would execute us. After that was all done, after about a fairly almost a day's work, we were back marched, marched down to the river's edge where the ferries were. And there were 150,000 people along the border, the edge of that river. And I had no idea where my family was. How was I going to locate them among more than 100,000 people? 
after running around for a couple of hours, I saw a familiar face, and they told me they'd seen our family a little ways up the road. So I ran there and I found them again. That was lucky. They had not been shipped across the river yet, and I was together with my family. Well, half a day later, we got shipped across to the town of Mogilev. And uh, if you look at the map, you can find it there, Mog Mogilev Podolsk. We got in there, and again, we found an old schoolhouse to uh, locate ourselves in. And it turns out, from uh, among all the people that got deported, we, about seven or eight families that were friends with each other, we banded together and said we all live together or die together. It's easier together than all by ourselves. So we stayed in one little corner of one of the old classrooms for a number of days. And one of the men in our group, he, I never, never, ever forget him. Lord Yu was his name. He was about four and a half foot tall. He weighed about 350 pounds. He was an enormous, deformed man. But he had eyes of steel. And he has a mind that penetrated everything. He was an unusual person. And he started to deal with the Romanian army to not uh, get us on forced marches to other camps in the area. Because 100,000 people couldn't stay where we are. We had to spread us out in half a dozen different concentration camps. And he managed to convince them to leave us in that little town of Mogilev and promise them that he is an excellent businessman like our president, that he manages to to set up maybe a little black market somewhere, and the Romanian soldiers and the Romanian officers will profit by it. And they let us stay in the town of Mogila. There again, we found an old schoolhouse at the edge of town, and we moved in there. There were no windows, the roof was partially broken. Uh, part of the neighboring building were all burnt out, but we moved in. And that was in the fall of 1941. And then the hard times started, we had no food. The Romanians put barbed wire around our camp. It wasn't like the German barracks. It was a Romanian concentration camp, which was not as bad as, it, as the German camps. To give you a little statistic, out of the, all the people that got into those camps, 70% got killed, 30 made it out alive, 30%. In the German concentration camps like Werbebelz and like Auschwitz, like Dachau, only 2% managed to survive the war. The rest of them died. Uh, it was a little easier to deal with the Romanians because you can always make deals with them. Um, at this point, I remember a little story that was told about the different cultures in Europe. I'm sure many of you have been to Europe and you realize that the various cultures, France, Germany, England, Eastern Europe, they all differ from each other quite distinctly, not only in language, but also in their character, in their outlook, in their limitations as to what they were able to think about. The story goes, that during the French Revolution, after the French Revolution rather, three men got condemned to die under guillotine. One of the three was a German, one was an Englishman, and one was a Frenchman. Well, the guillotine was there, and the people stood out in the marketplace to watch the executions, and they took the Frenchman down to the guillotine and the blade was rolled up, and then they let the blade come down to knock off the chop of his head. And one inch from the man's neck, the blade got stuck. Well, like here, when we had a horse safe here, and he got hung, if the rope tore, they let him go. That was the international unspoken rule. Well, the blade got stuck, they let the man out, and he sang the French Marseillaise, and he went away happy. The next one was the Englishman. 
Same thing happened. Blade came down, one inch from the stack and stopped. They raised the blade, and the guy walked away. Long live the queen. The last one was the German. And he walked up to the guillotine and he said, I'm not going to put my head under this until you fix the damn machine. <laughs> <laughs> the story here shows that the Germans, very cultured, very well educated, well schooled, but they, they obey. If the law says these people can get killed, you kill them. Whatever the Führer, the leader of the nation said, people did without question. And we were, of course, victims of that. That whatever Germany did during the Second World War, like killing six million Jews in concentration camps to burn and burn them in their crematorium, because the Führer said that's okay. Well, anyway, we were in this. Uh, little town where fortunately we were not ruled by the Germans in that place but by the Romanians. Or German soldiers and SS troops came through, but the place was under the administration of the Romanians. We had no food. The uh, place was surrounded, as I said before, by barbed wire. They closed the gates and threw away the key. We were not fed. Nobody cared whether we died of starvation or that we died of Russian cold of 30 degrees below zero in the winter time. And many of obviously succumbed. We were lucky we had a roof over our head. Well, what was my job? They had known that I had cleaned out that uh, schoolyard in the town of Otaki. And in the place we lived in, there was there were no restrooms. We had a latrine. Fred is an expert at latrine cleaning. So I became the latrine cleaner. And that's what I had to do, and that's what I did. Unfortunately, uh, there is a disease in those days that one catches from latrine cleaning, and that's typhoid fever. So months after I did that work, I got typhoid fever. And it started out with a terrible headache and a very high fever. And uh, you know, in, uh, this school building had several little buildings next to it. There was a physician there, Dr. Goldstein, I remember him. And uh, my mother called the doctor, come look at our boy, my boy had typhoid fever. Well, he came in, and of course he had no medications, he had no instruments. Uh, what can he do? Except he looked at me and said, yeah, the kid has typhoid fever. Chances of survival? Almost non-existent. So uh, what they did with people who had, it's very, very contagious. So what we did with these people that had typhoid fever in that crowded environment, they took them out and brought them down to what they call in our ghetto, the hospital. It was a ward. He put people in, nobody's allowed to get in, nobody's allowed to come out, no food was brought in, no doctors were allowed in. You just lie there for a couple of days and you die. Then, the people that, in that room that we live, there was actually 30 people in that one small room, spread out on the floor to, to sleep at night. And they uh, said, you know what we'll do? If little Matt, at the time, these days I was the 